Derek Gibner joined by Dan Elman, and we're going to discuss how to bet harness racing. Uh, in this segment, we're going to look at thoroughbreds versus harness racing. That's why I brought Dan in, because I consider him to be the thoroughbred expert. I'll be the harness expert, but we both, I think, know a little bit about each. No, we certainly do, and I, there, there's so many differences and similarities between harness and thoroughbreds. I really think we need to start talking about the differences first, Derek, and a lot in thoroughbred is about speed, 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 figures, 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 and who the, and the race goes to the swift. And I'm not saying that speed is not important in harness racing, but I think trips are really the key to deducing the winner of a harness race. There's no doubt about it. When I sit down to a handicap a harness race, especially on a smaller track, I'm trying to figure out where every single horse in that race is going to be during the entire mile. You know, and that'll be another thing we could discuss in a second is the difference in distances because in harness racing, we basically have one for the most part. and thoroughbred, there's very distances here. But yeah, just trying to figure out where everyone's going to be during the race is very important. Speed plays a role, but not necessarily as big of a role as it would in thoroughbred. And especially when you're looking at half-mile racetracks where the outside posts are just almost an automatic pitch. Let's talk about Yonkers and the half-mile track. If you draw post position eight, you're in big trouble from the opening bell. You basically have to be taken back to last and you need everything to go your way. Lots of times drivers are just going to use that race as a training mile and horse players would be very wise to throw that race out if it's a dull running line. And the great thing about harness racing is these horses run. They run weekly. So you can have a race where it doesn't look great on paper. You can throw it out. You can go back to a more representative post position, a more representative race, and hopefully get a better performance at better odds. Yeah, that's definitely a key. When you think about harness racing versus thoroughbred, if a thoroughbred races, you might have to wait six weeks, eight weeks, three months before you can bet that trouble trip horse back. Where in harness racing, Without a doubt, within three weeks, you're definitely better than that horse, and most of the time, you can come back in a week. And layoffs are very, very important, and I think it's an important negative sometimes in harness racing. If a horse is away for two or three weeks, you have to wonder why. In thoroughbreds, you don't wonder that at all. If Todd Pletcher comes back in two weeks, you have a heart attack because you can't believe he's running these horses. But at the end of the day, uh, you want horses that run on a regular basis in a harness standpoint. You're going to get horses that run in qualifiers. I'm not sure you get enough off a qualifier that's really going to replicate a race standpoint from a harness uh, effort. Layoffs, very, very important in harness racing, perhaps a negative factor. Thoroughbreds, they come back 61 to 120 days all the time, no sweat. I would say one of the things that's changed a lot in harness racing over the years is the fact that horses do come back off qualifiers much better now than they used to in the past. In the past, it would be the horse would qualify once or twice and then they need two or three starts. But nowadays, you find a lot of trainers. There's a trainer named Oki Svansted who came over from Sweden. He's an expert at taking his horses, qualifying once. The qualifying line doesn't look like anything. And then all of a sudden, he comes up with a big mile. And that's more of a, the thoroughbred model. And I think you've seen a little bit, it, when we get to similarities, I guess, a little bit you've seen is harness racing is kind of modeling after thoroughbred, especially at the stake level. And the key is record keeping, especially in harness racing, where you may not have that formulator available to you, where you can keep all of the stats of trainers and horsemen getting uh, horses ready off layoffs or uh, you know qualifying victories, etc. Keep records at your local track. Keep records of your local horses. They run every week. You're going to see horses. And again, we see differences thoroughbred versus harness. Number one, the sulky ver or the race bike versus the saddle. You've seen horses many times just locked in down towards the inside, especially on tracks without a passing rain lane. They can't get out. These are horses you want to follow next time out. But I do think we should talk a little bit about good trips in harness racing, especially for fans that are new to harness racing. Obviously, you want to be on the lead on uh, half-mile tracks. That is a very, very powerful angle. You'd love to be second over on mile tracks as well. We're yeah. in the pocket. Well, you know what's you know changed a lot in the sport over the years is the uncovered trip. It used to be that the uncovered trip oh, death. was death. You, you throw the horse right out. Oh, the horse was uncovered. He has no shot. Now it's completely changed where the uncovered trip is actually a decent trip because speed carries so much further nowadays than it did even 10 or 20 years ago that these horses go uncovered and they just keep finding more and finding more. Obviously being on the lead is the best place to be, 
but you know, uncovered is not that bad. Second over is a good spot as well, where you're riding second behind the horse on the outside or in the pocket if you're on a track that actually has a passing lane or it may be a mile track where you can actually get that stretch room. But you don't want to be more than, I would say, five lengths off the lead because if you're further back than five lengths, it's very hard to make up that ground. I think the three-hole trip is all is sort of become sort of the death trip in harness racing right now where, let's say it's a half-mile track, you have an opportunity to pull, maybe you don't want to pull first over and you end up just locked down on the inside. Well, okay, you're behind the pocket sitter who might be able to come up the inside or get to the outside. You've got a lot of work to do. There's going to be horses to your outside you're not going to be able to get out. You're unlikely to come up the pocket. Those might be horses, especially if they have a little bit of late pace or trot that you might want to follow next time out. Yeah, no doubt about it. Some of the best places to watch when it comes to harness racing to find out what the bet next week is the back of the pack because you can see a lot going on back there that you, you're going to see a driver that, you know, maybe looks like he has more horse, but he has no room. The, the, that's where the money's to be made. Everyone sees what happens near the front. Not a lot of people look at the back of the pack. And harness racing also, uh, a little bit of a difference with thoroughbred racing is the pace of the race, where a lot of times pace is really determinant in thoroughbred racing. There is often two, three horses battling it out on the lead. Well, you're going to see a closer more often than not win these races. Um, I think that in a situation in harness racing, it's sort of, I, I would try to view it as a dance especially at the half mile track. You know the horses from the inside are going to go. You know the horses on the outside are going to take back. And it's up to you to guess who's going to come first up, who's going to come up second up. Is there going to be enough pace to set these horses up or is the speed just way too dangerous? Uh, lots of differences, lots of similarities in harness and horse racing. The biggest similarity, the fun aspect and a chance to make a big score. Yeah, no doubt about it. The fun aspect is definitely large and, and obviously hitting for a lot of bit money as well. I mean, what I think is the most important thing is the replays. I mean, in either sport, whether it's thoroughbred or, or harness, I mean, you go back and you can watch these things and that's where all the money to be made is watching what happened last week and using that knowledge. And not only last week, but if a horse is mired in post eight, you go back two, three weeks, and if you keep notes, you're going to know a horse that's sharp that might have a legitimate excuse that you just throw a bad running line out that most folks that just go to the track and open up the program, they're just going to see the last line and say, well, this horse might be going off form. Uh, we're going to throw him out, but you would know because you have notes. He had a legitimate excuse for the last race, maybe buried down inside, maybe had a terrible outside post position. You go back two, three races maybe against better horses even, and all of a sudden you've found a very sharp horse. I agree a thousand percent with what Derek said about replay watching. It's very, very important in thoroughbred racing, but at the end of the day, um, what you're looking for in, in, in thoroughbreds is sort of the same thing in harness. You're looking for horses that are compromised by a scenario, whether it be pace, whether it be trip. In harness racing, it's very important to watch the replays because a lot of times the running line doesn't tell the story. A lot of times in thoroughbred racing, the chart caller doesn't tell the complete story. There are track biases in thoroughbreds. And I'm interested in your thoughts. Do you see track bias as a major factor in harness racing? I see track bias more as a factor on the larger tracks maybe at a track like the Meadowlands, but it's not as prevalent, I think, as it is in thoroughbred racing, you know, where you'll see you know, a track where you'll have nine wire-to-wire -wire winners on a 10-race card, and it's clear that if you're the inside speed horse, you're gonna win. It's not like that in harness racing. You'll get from time to time, like uh, the Meadowlands during the winter, sometimes if, if it's really cold out, the track will get really hard, and horse after horse will just roll down the road. But it doesn't happen as often as it happens in thoroughbred racing. And about replays as well, you have to remember if you're smarter than the rest of the pack, if you're more observant than the rest of the pack, you're going to make money because the, this is an objective observation. Everyone in thoroughbred racing has a fig, probably a buyer speed figure. So if everyone has the same fig, they're probably going to land on the same horse. But if you're watching races and you see something that's different, Derek and I might have a completely different opinion on a horse in a thoroughbred race. Derek might say, wow, this horse really was up close to a pace, blew by the leaders, and won very impressively. And I'm going to say, Derek, you're nuts. This horse was sitting behind a speed duel. Those two horses collapsed in front of him. This horse went to the front and just had a candy trip. This time around, there's not going to be that situation. It's a different story and will be proven right 
at the windows and when these horses run back next time out. That's the great key to trip handicapping, whether it be thoroughbred or harness racing. It is objective. From a speed figure standpoint, it's not. The 90 buyer horse is going to be faster than the 50 horse. And whether you have a trip with a 50 horse or not, you're probably not going to make up that 40 point difference in speed. That's one of the things I love about horse racing in general is that you can have 10 guys in the room and there could be 10 opinions. And everyone's looking at the race a little bit differently and it just it makes for interesting conversation, if nothing else. Um, similarities, there are differences. When I look at a, a thoroughbred race, I'm looking at buyer figures, I'm looking at the, you know maybe the horse's recent works, I'm looking at trainer stats. What are you looking for when you look at a, a thoroughbred race? Well, I think you look at the, the three basic tenets of handicapping, speed, pace, and class. Speed being buyer speed figures. Who are the fastest horses in the race? I'm not saying take the best last buyer every single time, but you can easily eliminate pretenders and isolate the three or four main contenders in a race simply by using figures and then by using replays and the other tenants that I mentioned, you can whittle them down to a top contender. Pace, perhaps the most underappreciated tenant of thoroughbred handicapping. Who is going to get the lead? Who is going to be helped by a pace scenario? We've seen one run closers. Remember Strike the Gold back in the day. He needed a fast pace or he had no shot. He would always come with his big late run, but if there was no pace in front of him, it would be too little, too late. It's very important to try to dope out the pace scenario of the race and try to figure out, is there a lone speed that will be just too tough to catch? Will there be some pace and some hitting to give it a fair shot for the closers? And of course, the class standpoint. Andy Byer might not like that. He probably thinks that figs trump class. But I do think there is a place for class, especially at lower level racetracks where you see horses. There's so many conditions nowadays, Derek. Starter optional claimers, beaten claimers. But there are ways to, to dope out and find class. Horses that, let's say, run for an optional 40,000, now winners of two other than, that are now running for a uh, 15,000 now winners of two life. That's like a triple drop in class. And if that horse has shown competitive figs in the past, I'd expect to wake up. Class drops are also extremely important Absolutely. in harness racing. Horses are going, the conditions have become so complex. As horses try to, you know, as tracks try to fill, you know, their full fields, you know, they add condition after condition, also eligible, also eligible. It's very important to look at these conditions and find out exactly why each horse is in the race. How did this horse get into the race? How do they fit into that particular field? You know, that's an important factor as well. Some of the things I look for, including the trip, are also the best horse in the race. I, I'm just looking at the field. You can look at just final times. If there's a speed figure there, you can look at that. I don't rely on it as much as I rely on it when I'm looking at a buyer figure, you know, when I'm looking at a thoroughbred race. But for harness racing, it's still important to figure out who the best is. What do you look at when you look at a harness race? Well, what I like to look at from a class standpoint, again, we talked about pace and lone speed, especially at half mile tracks. Who's the speed nearest the rail? Who's going to be able to get away with an opening quarter mile? Is there going to be a horse that's going to quarter brush and put pressure on this horse early and then might set things up for, let's say, the second over horse or the pocket horse? I'm looking for a horse that can get to the front, control the tempo, especially during that second quarter, past the stands the first time, and open it up when the racing begins. Getting back to class though, these conditions can be helpful. Let's say now winners of 6,000 in the last 12 starts, you at least in your past performances can take a look. How much money has this horse earned in the last 12 starts? Is this horse just barely qualifying for this condition? I think especially when a horse is dropping a level like that, it's a very major indicator that this horse is a great fit, probably can handle a step higher uh, level of competition, and it's going to be very dangerous in this spot. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, when you get those straight condition levels or even the straight claiming levels, it's very cut and dry. You know, this horse is going up in class, this horse is going down in class. And you could just look at it, you could see it, and there's really not a lot of homework to do. When you get these classes that are now one is a 6,000 in last five, also eligible, track master rating 74 or less, also eligible, now one is of 120. That's when it becomes a little bit more difficult, but it's one of the differences between harness and thoroughbred, I think. I don't think there is as many conditions they have in thoroughbred racing, whereas, you know, now one is a two other than allowance. I mean, we're getting there, unfortunately, and it's really a, 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 a skull buster for the horse player to just figure out the conditions, especially with these beaten conditions coming up now for three year olds or three and four year olds, which have never won three races. It really is getting to be a lot. 
Uh, I think that horse players should follow their circuit, follow each horse, take dedicated trip notes when they have an opportunity. Nowadays, you can just punch up replays on the, uh, on the internet when you have time and take notes on each and every horse. You're going to find idiosyncrasies for each horse. There are going to be some trotters out there that just happen to break at the most inopportune times at short prices. And these are the horses that look too good to be true when they reel off two or three good races. You're going to want to single them in a major multiple race play. And in the back of your mind and on your notes, you're going to say, he may not be the most untrustworthy sort. Let's use at least one more. You're going to learn the little quirks about each and every horse just by watching replays. And to me, that's so valuable. Yeah, I completely agree with Dan. The best thing you can do is to pick a track yep. or pick two tracks and follow those tracks because you're going to remember things that happened six months ago, nine months ago. They're going to lead you to $12 winners, $18 winners, $24 winners. Just follow a track, pay attention to what's going on, and I think you'll be a winner. That's uh, Learn to Bet Harness Racing for today. Thoroughbred versus uh, Harness. Good luck.